Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called The Catholic Church and the Cooperative State. This is Chapter 6 of the book Behind the Dictators from Leo Herbert Lehman, which I'm reading for the moment actually on my channel, Juggler 66, and you can follow all the readings in the playlist Behind the Dictators. I decided to read this book as I read last year Rulers of Evil and then Babylon Mystery Religion because this book absolutely falls in the same realm and it is a book that you cannot get anymore in a written copy as I was told. Maybe you find it somewhere used on eBay or whatever but it is out of print and it is very important for all of us to know that Roman Catholicism and Nazi fascism, which is so condemned by, after what happened in Germany between 1933 and 1945, we have to know that the connection between the Roman Catholic Church and this Nazi Germany in that time uh, is something that is still very much alive. And the author wrote this book in 1942, remind you, that was during World War II. So, of course, he didn't have insight into the things that happened after the World War in our time today. But we now have history to look back upon and to uncover, to unveil the secrets that he writes in this book. And uh, I very much like the first five chapters I read. So, today, on the 24th of July, I set myself down to read to you the next chapter, which is only five pages or something, uh, short pages, it's a short book also, it only has 108 pages on my PDF, which is called The Catholic Church and the Cooperative State. So let's go reading. A few years ago, Americans considered, incre uh, considered it incredible that the Catholic Church could be officially in favor of the fascist cooperative state much less that it could have been in any way responsible for the origin and spread of corporatism. They refused to believe that the vaunted encyclical Quadragesimo Anno of Pope Pius XI was an endorsement of Nazi fascist objective to discredit and destroy the structure of the liberal democratic state and to set up in its stead authoritarian hierarchical regimes. Now, what is the encyclical letter Quadragesimo Anno? I will go a little bit into that. And when you read the uh, Wikipedia link on Quadragesimo Anno, in one sentence it says, quote, Essential contributors to the formulation of the encyclical Quadragesimo Anno were the German Jesuits. Unquote. Do I need to say more? It all comes down to what the Roman Catholic Church is teaching from Thomas Aquinas, the Theosophical Doctor of the Church. And the by Antichrist Pope Francis today repeatedly taught, quote-unquote, common good. You know, he mentioned common good at least six times in the speech 2015 he gave to a joint session of Congress and Senate in the United States of America. For the Roman Catholic Church there is no other form of government acceptable than authoritarian rulership with the so-called Vicar of Christ on top. All these papal papers, encyclicals, apostolic letters and papal bulls are full of casuistry and sophistry to appear to the common reader as fair and godly, whereas when understanding the text correctly you hear the devil speak continue in the book. Yet this encyclical embodied the whole aim of the Catholic Church for half a century before the rise of fascism, namely the total reconstruction of the then existing social order on, uh, on Catholic fascist lines. The real title of this encyclical is, quote, on the reconstruction of the social order, unquote, and its plan is actually the ecclesiastical of counterpart of the fascist military onslaught against liberalism and democracy. Now, I want to read to you two quotes. 
The first one comes from fascist Italian leader Benito Mussolini. Quote, Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism. That's what we are speaking about here, eh? Because it is the merger of corporate and state power. Unquote. And the Civilta Cattolica, which is the house organ of the Jesuits in Rome, states, quote, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Unquote. And I will make a similar comment a few minutes later. But first, I keep on reading on the second paragraph. Americans heard Father Coughlin preach this for eight years, but merely shrugged their shoulders and took it for granted that his rantings were those of a crackpot and had nothing to do with the true aims and activities of the Roman Catholic Church. It can now be seen that this plan of the Vatican, though camouflaged in terms to quiet the fears of Americans, was being carried forward officially by the Roman Catholic Church in the United States as vigorously as in European countries. In our first issue of the Converted Catholic magazine, attention was directed to the plan as published under the auspices of the National Catholic Welfare Conference and signed by 131 Catholic prelates and noted laymen. It advocated a change in the United States Constitution to permit the enactment of the recommendations of Pope Pius XI into American law. It praised the NRA, which is now admitted as having been patterned on fascist cooperative lines, and which was ab abolished by anonymous opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court as destructive of American democracy. Well, um, this quote is from uh, John T. Flynn in the New York World Telegram, 2nd of July, 1940, where he states that by the NRA, President Roosevelt unwittingly Quote, attempted to introduce this feature of fascism into our country. Unquote. So Roosevelt was as much a Nazi as Adolf Hitler. I'm quite sure about that. And you know, the sentence ended with the U.S. Supreme Court as destructive of American democracy. Uh, you know, there was a time when the majority of that court, the U.S. Supreme Court, was still Protestant, not Catholic, as of 2016. Because today, in 2016, I think we have six Catholics and three Jews on the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court's mission is to serve the, the Constitution and to interpret the Constitution. So, if and I say if, because it not is, but if the Constitution was a Protestant paper, how come Catholics and Jews, who have other beliefs than Protestantism, are to interpret the Constitution? What good do you think will come of them interpreting the rights of Americans? Now, when you look around, especially since 9-11-2001, you know how they interpret the Constitution. Think about that sometime. So cautiously had this plan been advanced in the United States that it was not until the Roman Catholic hierarchy in 1940 issued its pronouncement of the Church and the Social Order that the press could safely headline the news that, quote, the Catholic Hierarchy Advocates Cooperative System for the U.S., unquote. Strange to say, there was then no public outcry. <laughs> Is there ever a public outcry? And even now, when patriotic Americans are turning the searchlight of suspicion on every sign of political and economic, uh, economic subversion, the greatest Trojan horse of them all continues to tower unmolested in the very shadow of their searchlights. In newspaper offices, this Trojan horse of Jesuit Catholicism is still regarded as the feared and untouchable, quote-unquote, sacred cow. The misconception that the cooperative system is purely an economic matter has blinded the American press and public to the real aim behind Catholicism's advocacy of it. 
Corporatism is indeed the economic ingredient of fascism, but it is also the essential element of fascism, since the corporatives uh, make a parliament or congress unnecessary. For these corporatives are the means through which the, leaders, uh, the leader exercises his dictatorial will. It was precisely because the Supreme Court judged that by the NRA, Congress, and, uh, Congress had abdicated its powers and was thus paving the way for fascism, that it took vigorous action against it. The entire ideology of fascism and Nazism in social, economic, educational, religious and military matters is contained in the cooperative system. Corporatism is fascism. So, let me ask you, what does this mean in our days of so-called globalism that abolishes the middle class that came out of the Reformation? And I want, you remind, I want to remind you again here of the quote from Benito Mussolini. Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it is the merger of corporate and state power. If you look around in the United States today and you look at companies like, I only take one example, Monsanto, and how they are going to rule the world, how they are already ruling America with all the new laws coming out that you are not even allowed anymore to mark foods that use gene uh, genetically modified organisms, all because of lobbying of Monsanto. Where can you find a better example than Monsanto or the whole pharmaceutical industry Obamacare and all that stuff to see how corporates, corporations and state work together. And when they work together to pull on the same string and they do that in the same direction, that is called fascism. Hidden, I say, under the name maybe of democracy in the United States of America. Because the People's Republic in the United States of America has long been hijacked by democracy, which is an invention of the Jesuits, because then a minority rules over the majority. And let me, uh, let me ask you this question. What else is fascism, where one ruler rules over all. And what else is the Roman Catholic Church where one Pope rules over all? It's fascism. The Roman Catholic bishops, though cautiously, have spoken nonetheless as plainly in favor of Nazi fascist ideology as the Catholic hierarchies of Italy, Spain and Germany. Like Hitler and Coughlin, they start from a standpoint of quote-unquote positive Christianity. Well, again, like I said earlier in other readings of this book, when I read positive Christianity, what they are using here, you should read Christianity as Catholicism, because that's what they stand for. It has nothing to do with biblical Christianity as all to do with Roman Catholicism, with, which comes out of Babylon, which is sun worship, when you followed my readings of Babylon mystery religion. It has nothing to do with biblical Christianity. So like Hitler and Coughlin, they start from a standpoint of positive Catholicism and call for a quote, a comprehensive program for restoring Christ to his true and proper place in human society, unquote, for a reform of morals and a profound renewal of the Christian spirit, that's again Catholic spirit, which must precede the social reconstruction. Unquote. May I ask a question here? The author writes, 
and call for a comprehensive program for restoring Christ to his true and proper place in human society. What is the proper place of Jesus Christ in quote-unquote human society? I would very much like to learn what that entails. Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the Creator of all the world and everything that is in it. What is His proper place in human society? This is a very, very strange construction of sentence, I think. Something maybe to think about and reflect a little bit on when you read something like this. Implicit in this is the customary anti-Semitic and fascist condemnation of the Masonic Judaic Pluto democracies as resting upon an immoral, un-Christian foundation. It was in this same way that the Roman Catholic bishops of Italy, Spain and Germany supported the rise of fascism and Nazism in their respective countries. In their pastoral letter from Fulda, <coughs> city in Germany, on August 30th, 1936, the Roman Catholic hierarchy of Germany solemnly declared to their people, quote, There is no need to speak at length of the task which our people and our country are called upon to undertake. May our Führer, with the help of God, succeed in this extraordinary difficult work. What we desire is that belief in God as taught by Christianity, again, <laughs> replace that with Catholicism, will not be overcome, but that it be universally recognized that this faith constitutes the only sure foundation upon which can be built the powerful and victorious bulwark destined to hold back the forces of Bolshevism. Unquote. Now, as taught by Christianity, well, we said already, change that to Catholicism. But that it be universally recognized. Well, what's another word for universal? Catholic, right? So that it will be universally and by Catholics recognized that this faith, speaking of Roman Catholicism, constitutes the only sure foundation upon which can be built the powerful and victorious bulwark destined to hold back the forces of Bolshevism. Now, Bolshevism is based on uh, the Russian Revolution a few years before the book was written that brought in communism. So Bolshevism and communism is the same. But communism was planned, invented and also carried out by the Jesuits. They play the left side and they play the right side. And either side who wins, because they play them both, they win. And when the Jesuits win, the Roman Catholic Church wins. And when the Roman Catholic Church wins, Satan wins. But let's continue in the book. All doubts as to the wholehearted support of Hitler's program from the beginning by the Catholic hierarchy in Germany are cleared up by a per uh, perusal of the discourses and writings of Bishop Aloysius Hudal, rector of the Collegio Teutonico in Rome, and one of, of the closet consultors of the Holy See on German and Austrian affairs. In his book, The Fundamentals of National Socialism, he repeats the contents of many of, uh, of his allocutions uh, to the German colony in Rome. The following is a sample, quote, from the book, The Fundamentals of National Socialism. Let us see, for example, how interesting are some of the object objectives of the National Socialist Programme. Popular unity as opposed to everything that can disrupt, language as the nation's spiritual bond, consciousness of Germany's historical destiny, the sentiment of race consciousness, the attempt to solve the Jewish question, assurance of pure German breeding, destruction of parties, culture of the family, 
and the ideal of the large family considered as a matter of honor and national pride, the militarization of the nation, a new system of instruction and education, the cooperative idea, the aristocratic principle of government by a leader, above all, the German people are indebted to this spiritual movement for the slow destruction of the ideology of the rights of man upon which the edifice of Weimar was founded, as well as for destruction of faith in formal juridical constitutions, of the dialectics of parliamentary procedures, and of democracy." Unquote. In order to prove the identity of interests between Catholicism and Nazi socialism, Bishop Udall quotes from the Catholic German historian Josef Lortz of Minister, who in his work History of the Churches shows that Catholicism and Nazi socialism agree on the following points. Quote, First, both are mortal enemies of Bolshevism, liberalism and relativism that is to say, of the three deadly maladies from which our age is suffering and which fiercely attack the work of the Church. The essential ideas of Nazi socialism, together with the principle of liberty bound to, uh, to authority, correspond exactly to the ideas that Pope Gregory and, uh, Popes Gregory and Pius the, uh, the IX endeavored to impose upon the 19th century in face of a world which called itself progressive, and which received their teachings with sarcastic smiles. To this is added their common fight against Freemasonry. Second, their common fight against the godless movement, against public immorality, against the stupid doctrine of equality, which is destructive of life, their fight for a rational and fertile structure of human society as desired by God, and for the cooperative structure of the state as proposed by Pope Leo XIII and Pius XI in Quadragesima Anno, which I mentioned already in the beginning of this reading, their common fight against a mode of life that is unnatural and deprived of all healthy traditions as encountered in great modern cities and workmen's localities. Third, by its principle of authority and government by a leader, a principle upon which all national life rests, national socialism combines the German and the Roman Catholic attitude towards human life. I hope you understood that well, that this last part of the sentence is essential to understand. National socialism, Nazism, fascism, combines the German and Roman Catholic attitude towards human life. Fourth, most important of all, National Socialism is a confession of faith. Opposing, as it does, unbelief and destructive doubt, it has convinced all classes of society that the outlook of the believer is not, as liberalism has taught, an attitude of inferiority but one that carries man toward, towards the total accomplishment of his destiny. And although the Roman Catholic Church should never identify itself with any movement, it cannot afford to miss the opportunity of gratefully accepting the help of this powerful ally, Nazi ally, yeah, in the fight which she is carrying on against atheistic rationalism. Unquote. And although the Roman Catholic Church should never identify itself with any movement, you know, that is why, for example, the Roman Catholic Church is no part of the World Council of Churches, but overseas. Is. That is why the Roman Catholic Church, or better said, the Vatican, the Holy See, is not a full member of the United Nations, but has still an observer status, which is guaranteed and gives them freedom and diplomatic immunity and everything else outside of the realm of the UN. They cannot be part of it, because with the Pope, who says that he is God on earth, on the outside, he has to stand above that. 
So it says here, and although the Roman Catholic Church should never identify itself with any movement, so uh, that means, okay, we can never be for Nazism, we can never be for democracy, we can never be for communism, we can never be for this or for that. It cannot afford to miss the opportunity of gratefully accepting the help of this powerful ally, which is Nazism, fascism, in the fight which she is carrying on against atheistic rationalism. This is really a sentence one has to think about a little bit. This Catholic historian calls attention to the fact which American observers have failed to note, that Nazi fascism is but the outcome of events in which the Catholic Church has played a decisive role for centuries. He says that National Socialism is the, quote, fulfillment of destiny, unquote, and goes on to say, quote, it was born originally out of the most profound tendencies of the epoch, of which it is the crowning act. Undoubtedly, we now have the right to speak of an essential transformation of the birth of a veritable new era, the accomplishments of which will remain. A new epoch has opened which will serve religion and the church and which will be extraordinarily well armed to carry on the fight against atheism. Unquote. Franz von Papen, a papal knight and Hitler's most successful henchman, declared in Der Völkische Beobachter, a German Nazi uh, newspaper at that time, on January 14, 1934, quote, The Third Reich is the first power which not only recognizes, but which puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Unquote. Doesn't that say enough? What more proof do you need for the connection even of fascism, Nazism as it was called in that time, fascism and the Roman Catholic Church? and that one is just the mirror of the other. This and much more is quoted by Bishop Udall to prove the fundamental identity of the aims and purposes of Catholicism and Nazi, Nazi socialism. The Catholic bishops in the United States cannot afford to be as frank in supporting Nazi fascist ideology in this country. They cannot but admit, however, that their fellow bishops in Nazi fascist countries have been correct in their analysis of the benefits which this anti-liberal and anti-democratic ideology will bring to the organization of Roman Catholicism. And this ends the reading of chapter 6 of Behind the Dictators. The last sentence is quite interesting, right? The Catholic bishops in the United States cannot afford to be as frank in supporting Nazi fascist ideology in this country. They cannot but admit, however, that their fellow bishops in Nazi fascist countries have been correct. They have been correct in their analysis of the benefits which this anti-liberal and anti-democratic ideology will bring to the organization of Roman Catholicism. There is a bishop, I think it was, um, I will put the video, the, the picture here in the video that I make later of this, so then you can read it for yourself, who stated in the uh, New York, I think, New York, uh, Ch Chicago Tribune, it was uh, in the Chicago Tribune 1903, who said, when the United States rule the world, Roman Catholicism, the Roman Catholic Church, will rule the world. That has been their aim all along. And as you understood from this reading, that actually the policy of Roman Catholicism is equal to fascism, Nazism. And that then should be no wonder why they used the Vatican Red Lines, and why they used Operation Paperclip to import
support all the important German people from Nazi Germany at that time to import them into the United States of America. Do you know that Reinhard Gehlen, the spy master of Adolf Hitler, was connected to Wild Bill Donovan, who founded, after leading the OSS, the Strategic Office, uh, the Office of Strategic, uh, what's it called, Security there, in the uh, Office of, yeah, you know, the OSS. <laughs> And out of which came then the CIA. So you have Nazis coming over to the United States of America, help funding, help starting and diverting from the OSS into the CIA, the CIA, which we have today, which is not actually the Central Intelligence Agency, but which means actually Catholics in action. There's really a lot to reflect about when reading this book and these um, different chapters that I'm reading here. You know, I've chosen not to read the whole book in one or two things uh, or readings. Uh, I chose to take the little um, the little pieces out of it because it has uh, I don't know twelve chapters, and uh, it seemed to me more interesting to read chapter by chapter and leave a little time between so that people can reflect on what we've just read wrote, uh, of what we just read here. Very, very interesting part what I read today. The Roman Catholic Church and the Cooperative State. Combine these two together and you have the rule of the New World Order, which is the Old World Order restored. Okay, I will continue next time on page 36 with chapter 7, which is called The Greatest Trojan Horse of Them All. Don't miss it. Hang on to Juggler 66 and the reading of the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehman. Do your own studies, and in the meantime, don't forget to put the Bible in the first place of all studies, where there is the only truth in this world ever to be found. Until next time, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye-bye.